identifying the sea beast of Revelation. Um, everybody hear me good? Am I good? Okay. Uh, it's been said that the preterist position stands or falls on the early date of Revelation. And, you know, for the most part, I'd have to agree. If the book of Revelation was not written before A.D. 70, it cannot be a prophecy about A.D. 70. Um, that being said, the extent of Nero Caesar's role in the book and the part it plays in helping to establish a pre-A.D. 70 date for the writing of the book cannot be overemphasized. As Ken Gentry says, <clears throat> as all roads lead to Rome, so do they all terminate at Nero's palace. Nero's specter haunts the pages of Revelation. And while there is much collaborate, collaborating evidence to support the early date, this other evidence alone would not establish it apart from the direct evidence stemming from Nero, in my opinion. Uh, Thirty years ago, as I read David Chilton's commentary on Revelation, The Days of Vengeance, I put it up there on the slide, the front cover of the book, I was blown away as he demonstrated how Nero fit the profile of the beast like a hand in a glove. The three most salient points for me that stood out were, number one, the 42-month war with the Holy Ones, the number of the beast, and the identity of the sixth king. While I'm sure most everyone here is familiar with these three things, I'll just uh, recount them briefly. Uh, first, the 42-month war with the Holy Ones. In Revelation 13, 1 through 2, we're introduced to a seven-headed beast rising from the sea. In verse 4, the question is asked, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? As the chapter proceeds, we're told that this seven-headed beast is given a mouth to speak arrogant words and blasphemies and to act for 42 months. And it was given to him to make war with the holy ones and to overcome them. I think most people are familiar with the atrocities committed under Nero. He fed Christians to the lions. He burned them at the stake the original Roman candles, as Chilton says. According to, church, according to church tradition, both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul died at the hands of Nero. And as a matter of historical record, <clears throat> Nero's persecution of the church, his war with the Holy Ones to overcome them lasted 42 months from the beginning, from the middle of November, A.D. 64, to the beginning of June, A.D. 68. Uh, the second point that struck me in Chilton's work was uh, the number of the beast, 666. In Revelation 13, 18, John's readers are told, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. In the ancient world, Letters served as both letters of the alphabet and numerals in the numbering system. Thus, anyone's name could be calculated by simply adding up the numerical value of its letters. And there are many examples of this in antiquity. John's cryptogram, however, was not quite as easy as his readers might at first think. It required wisdom and understanding. The calculation had to be made in Hebrew, not Greek. This way, Greek-speaking Roman officials and informants couldn't easily, dec easily decode the fact that he was speaking of the emperor, Nero Caesar. Quick drink here. The identity of the sixth king. Finally, in Revelation chapter 17, John is told that the seven heads of the beast are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is. The other has not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a little while. The first five Caesars were Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius. Nero, the sixth Caesar, <clears throat> was on the throne as John was writing the book 
and seeing the vision. The seventh on the list, Galba, had not yet come. When he did, he only remained a little while. His reign only lasted six months. I've briefly touched on three important points here, the three that really struck me when I originally read Chilton's book. There's much more collaborating evidence for the early date of Revelation. In his book, Before Jerusalem Fell, Ken Gentry really leaves no stone unturned. If you haven't read it, there's a free PDF version online of the first edition that's easy enough to find. Uh, the book is currently in its third edition. Now, to his credit, G.K. Beale, and I heard Mike mention him, and I, I like him also, but he's, he's a non-millennialist, but he's a good guy. He's one of the few late date AD 95-ish advocates who attempts to interact with Gentry's arguments. Um, I feel we should always check out both sides of every issue. When you do, I think you'll find it's no exaggeration to say that the evidence for a pre-AD 70 date for the book of Revelation is simply overwhelming. The bottom line is this. Nero's footprints are all over Revelation. Since Nero played such a prominent role in the prophecy, and he died in A.D. 68, this places the writing of the book no later than A.D. 68, and hence before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Having said that, Revelation 19.20 presents us with a conundrum of sorts, a catch-22 for the preterist. In the context of the passage, the heavens open and Jesus comes on a white horse accompanied by heavenly armies in the sky. We understand this as a reference to Jesus coming in judgment in A.D. 70. Verse 20 states, And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire. Here's the monkey wrench. If Nero is to be identified with the beast, and Nero died in A.D. 68, how is it that the beast is seized and thrown alive into the lake of fire at that time. Critics of the preterist viewpoint waste no time in pointing out the apparent discrepancy. In an article entitled, Preterism Examined and Refuted, Charles Campbell, who I have a lot of respect for, uses this apparent inconsistency like a rhetorical weapon. His argument is succinct, to the point, and razor sharp. Nero committed suicide two years before preterists say Jesus came back. Preterists believe Jesus' prophecy about coming back in Matthew 24 was fulfilled in A.D. 70. But Nero committed suicide in June of 68, two years before A.D. 70. Likewise, Michael Heiser wonders why Nero gets mentioned so often. Nero is completely ruled out according to Heiser. The beast demise comes by the hand of Jesus when Jesus returns. That didn't happen with Nero. It doesn't describe Nero's demise by any stretch. So, for the life of me, continues Heiser, I don't know why people are still clinging to Nero. Now, I don't know if you caught this during my last speech, but I sort of like Michael Heiser a lot. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Michael Heiser, and... Um, when he says something, I take it seriously, so I take his objection uh, seriously. Um, so the very thing we cling to, the pre-AD 70 date of Revelation, or I'm sorry, the very thing we use to clinch the pre-AD 70 date of Revelation, the death of Nero in 68, becomes the means by which futurists discount any identification of Nero with the beast of Revelation at all. Both sides use Nero's death in A.D. 68 to support their position. <clears throat> so how do we approach this? 
if the opening three points, the 42-month war with the Holy Ones, the number of the beast, and the identity of the sixth king all point to Nero Caesar, does Revelation 19.20 harmonize with our previous conclusions? I've tried to research how other preterists attempt to tackle this problem. One way to approach this would be to distinguish between the generic identity of the beast, the Roman Empire as a whole, and the specific identity of the beast, Nero or whichever emperor was on the throne at any given time. This way, Nero's death in 68 would no longer be an issue. The Roman Empire itself was obviously still around two years later. The main problem with this is rather obvious. The Romans came out of the Jewish war relatively unscathed. They were the conquerors, not the conquered. Now, some who take this position argue that the beginnings of the downfall of the Roman Empire can be traced to the Roman Jewish War. But to place any part, to place the ultimate fulfillment of any portion of the book hundreds of years in the future really goes against the prophecy's repeated claim that the prophesied events therein were to shortly come to pass. Terms such as shortly, quickly, near, at hand, etc., clearly indicate the prophesied events were looming on the horizon when the book was written. To say the passage speaks of the eventual downfall of the Roman Empire just does not seem plausible. Another approach, and this is gaining traction on preterist websites, is to abandon the position that either Nero or Rome are the referent of the beast imagery at all. Instead, the increasingly popular idea is the beast imagery refer refers to first century Jewish religious zealots who persecuted Christians and wanted to overthrow Rome. The main problem with this is, once again, obvious. If we take Nero out of the equation and plug something else into that variable, the answer it yields negates the very reason we're looking for an A.D. 70 fulfillment in the first place. In other words, it's precisely because of Nero's identification as the beast that we can date the book as pre-A.D. 70. Basically, no one is going to look at the three points we opened with, the war with the Holy Ones, the number of the beast, and the identity of the sixth king, and think, wow, this is obviously speaking of first century Jewish religious zealots. This is so obvious. There's simply no compelling reason to make that connection. One would only make such a connection if the early date for Reve Revelation is already presupposed. By eliminating Nero as the beast, our preterist brothers who take this approach are now assuming what they are not able to prove. You simply can't make the case for the early date without Nero. In short, this approach is self-defeating. If we take Nero off the table, yes, we still have the temporal expectation of the author. Terms like shortly, quickly, near, at hand, etc. But if we can't establish the latest possible date for the book's composition to be A.D. 68, Nero's death, perhaps John and his readers were looking for events to take place soon in the lifetime of Domitian Caesar. Late date advocates <clears throat> to, the, to the writing of the book, they're going to try and argue for increased persecution and emperor worship under Domitian Caesar in the 90s. <clears throat> but I would like to point out, though, that anyone who attempts to make this case is really, really 30 years behind modern scholarship on the issue. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. A game changer is defined as an event, idea, or procedure that affects a significant shift in the current manner of doing or thinking about something. Leonard Thompson's 1990 book, The Book of Revelation, Apocalypse and Empire, is a game changer. According to Stephen Fryson in the Journal for the Study of the New Testament, there was a time when most interpreters were satisfied 
to describe the social setting of Revelation as a crisis <clears throat> under the emperor Domitian, who claimed divine authority and required humans to worship him. Since the publication of Thompson's book in 1990, however, it has been mostly clear that there was no crisis under Domitian and that imperial cults were not particularly exaggerated during his reign. And what's really important to note is that both Thompson, the author of the book, and Freisen, the writer of that article, they're both advocates of the late date. They believe Revelation was written in the 90s during Domitian's reign. But they're honest enough to admit that there simply was no crisis under Domitian. They're doing the work of true scholars, reporting the data as it truly is. Interestingly, in a 1991 critical review of Thompson's book, Ken Strand of Andrews University basically concedes Thompson's point that Domitian did not order the persecution of Christians, but dismisses it by saying, at this early time, Roman persecution of Christians was not normally by imperial decision, but was rather a local matter. But then, Strand notes that the sole exception to this was Nero. To echo Gentry again, the book of Revelation keeps taking us back to Nero's palace. With regard to Thompson's book, more recently, Mark Wilson of the Biblical Archaeological Society notes that even though decades have now passed since Thompson's pivotal book officially pronounced the Domitian persecution theory dead, and most scholars no longer accept the idea of Christian persecution under Domitian, nevertheless, such claims continue to circulate in articles, books, and sermons. This shows how long it takes to repudiate alternative facts that have circulated for over 1,500 years in Christendom. Wilson concludes by saying, the fake news that Domitian instigated a severe persecution of Christians and this claim, his claim to be master and God provoked this persecution, needs to be removed from the facts of early church history. Folks, Domitian is simply not a viable alternative to Nero as the persecuting power in the book of Revelation. Anyone who says otherwise is, as Mark Wilson says, buying into fake news with regard to church history. And they're completely going against the grain of uh, the last 30 years of modern scholarship on the issue. But this br brings us back to the question then. How do we reconcile Nero's death in 68 with the beast's final demise in AD 70? To try and remove Nero as the, as the referent of the beast imagery, and replace it with something like first century Jewish religious zealots isn't really an option in my opinion. Another approach is to see the entire Jewish war, AD 66 to 70, as part of Christ's judgment coming. Ken Gentry takes this approach and notes that the day of the Lord is not one particular day, Rather, it involves an extended period of judgment. In other words, it was not a one-and-done deal. The whole Jewish war with Rome is his judgment, and therefore his judgment coming. And like all wars, continues Gentry, the Jewish war did not happen in a moment. Nero's death occurs in the context of the three-and-a-half-year-long Jewish war after he himself had initiated it. To me, Gentry's approach is plausible and more plausible than the other two, especially if you look at the usage of the word parousia in its normal everyday language, where it's not referring to some eschatological event. It certainly doesn't carry the idea of a brief appearance. For example, Paul speaks of his own parousia to the Philippians, Philippians 1.26 and 2.12. We would assume that Paul actually spent some time in Philippi. Uh, the usage in this context implies an extended arrival and, er, an arrival and extended stay, followed by Paul's eventual departure. 
N.T. Wright points out that the very word, parousia, was a common word in Greco-Roman culture for an emperor or dignitary making a state visit to a city province. The operative word here being visit. The visiting dignitary didn't simply show up and immediately leave. There would have been an extended period of visitation. <clears throat> and this whole idea of Christ's parousia as an extended event would seem to be supported by Josephus' famous statement about heavenly armies on chariots in the sky surrounding the city of Jerusalem. As preterists, we're quick to use this passage in response to people who say that there were no heavenly anomalies or cosmic disturbances associated with the Jewish war. What we sometimes neglect to say, however, is that this miraculous event occurred in A.D. 66, the beginning of the war, and not A.D. 70, the end of the war. The bottom line, if the heavenly armies were seen at the beginning of the Jewish war, it is possible to see the entire span of judgment events as Christ's parousia, his royal visit, so to speak. My main problem with this would be that in Matthew 24, the actual coming of the Son of Man takes place after the tribulation of those days and doesn't seem to be equated with the tribulation or the entire period known as the tribulation. It would seem that the actual judgment coming of Christ is part of the larger overall parousia event. In Matthew 24, 29 through 30, it says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and then they will see the Son of Man coming, coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Most preterists would define the tribulation as the period of time beginning with the Neuronic persecution and extending to the Jewish-Roman war. Since Christ's coming happens after the tribulation, it cannot be the tribulation. So, where does this leave us? The evidence definitely points in the direction of Nero Caesar rather than first century Jewish religious zealots as the beast. But Nero died two years prior to Christ's coming in A.D. 70. And while it is true that the beast imagery would certainly extend beyond specifically Nero himself and would surely encompass the entire Roman Empire in general, the Roman Empire definitely did not fall in A.D. 70. Like any war, there were casualties on both sides, no doubt. But like any war, the casualties on the part of the victor cannot in any way be considered a defeat. The Romans were victorious in A.D. 70. Additionally, as many of our critics point out, Revelation 13.10 states regarding the beast, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. While it is true that Nero died at the hand of his own sword, the Romans were not taken captive in A.D. 70 by any stretch of the imagination. To borrow Heiser's language, this simply does not describe Nero's demise or first century Rome in any way whatsoever. And the idea of Christ coming as an extended judgment covering the entire period of the tribulation doesn't seem to fit the clear statement in Matthew 24 to indicate that Christ's coming takes place after the tribulation and is not to be equated with the tribulation. In my opinion, if we continue to see the beast as defined in terms of Nero and or the Roman Empire alone, we are clearly at an impasse when it comes to the beast's final demise and destruction. While the beast definitely manifests itself in terms of Nero and, and the first century Roman Empire, I would suggest that its ultimate identity was something much more ancient, an evil enemy of Yahweh whose origins stretch back eons before the first century.
The very language of Revelation 17.8 is indicative of this. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come out of the abyss. Was indicates something old, something ancient, something from the past. Is not indicates that this ancient entity had not yet come on the scene when John saw the vision. Interestingly, as we noted earlier, the sixth head of the beast, the sixth king, Nero, was on the scene when John saw the vision. This would suggest that this ancient enemy had not yet begun to use Nero for his own purposes yet when John wrote the book. The angel tells John, the beast is not, but the sixth head of the beast now is. The conclusion of the sixth ruler, Nero, about to be used by an ancient beastly power, seems inescapable. And just a quick sidebar, you heard Mike mention the word mellow. It means about to. It's used in this passage. This word, it pops up everywhere when it comes to eschatological passages in the New Testament. You can't escape it. You can't get around it. The events that we associate with the end times were about to occur in the first century. The appearance of the beast is no exception. This eschatological chaos monster would not wait for some 2,000 years to emerge from the abyss. He or it was about to rise from the spiritual chasm known as the abyss in the first century. And the beast's very origin itself points to something supernatural, something that transcends merely Nero or the Roman Empire. The, ab the abyss is a place of imprisonment for divine beings. It is where the demons beg Jesus not to send them in Luke 8.31. It's associated with the realm of the dead in Romans 10.7. It's where the demons, described as locusts, are released from in Revelation chapter 9. This strongly suggests a supernatural origin for and identification of the sea beast of Revelation. But can we get more specific? Does the Bible give us any clues as to the exact identity of this ancient enemy? Yes, it does. And John's readers would have recognized it instantly. And if you've ever read David Chilton's commentary on Revelation, you'd recognize it instantly as well. The idea of two beasts, one associated with the sea and the other associated with the land, as Revelation 13 describes, is a well-known and common motif in the ancient world. The names of these beasts were Leviathan and Behemoth, respectively. And, as you can see, this is precisely why David Chilton titled the section of his, of his commentary dealing with Revelation 13, Leviathan and Behemoth. David Chilton was way, way ahead of his time. More and more scholars are beginning to make the connection between Revelation 13 and the ancient Leviathan behemoth texts. Three of these texts from the Second Temple period are shown here. The common theme among them, Leviathan dwells in the abyss of the ocean, and behemoth dwells on the desert, desert dry land. According to DDD, Revelation 13 is blatantly informed by the Leviathan behemoth tradition. In this periscope, two kindred beasts rise up in united opposition to the righteous. The one beast from the sea, Revelation 13.1, and another beast which rose out of the land, Revelation 13.11. Um, in doing my research, I read a paper by uh, Rebecca Yi Lu, and I hope I have her name right, um, that was just fantastic, and I love the way she puts this. The imagery, the imagery of the beasts in Revelation 13 draws upon a range of myth, mythical Jewish and Gentile traditions regarding the Leviathan behemoth legend. After recounting Satan's failure in chapter 12 
to destroy the woman and her child, John then describes him as standing on the seashore, anxiously awaiting his allies to come to his aid, the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. JBL scholar Stephen J. Fryson notes that while commentators are nearly unanimous that Revelation 13 deals with Roman imperial power and the worship of the emperors, the primary structure for the narrative in Revelation 13 comes from the mythic pattern of Leviathan and Behemoth. Leviathan and Behemoth are two primordial monsters known from several Jewish texts. The oldest of these is Job chapters 40 to 41, where they are cited as two of God's most powerful creations. Scholar Andrew Angel, in his excellent book, Chaos and the Son of Man, concurs. While the beast from the sea represents Rome, and the beast from the land represents a local authority demanding emperor worship, Revelation 13 is a creative reworking of the Leviathan and Behemoth legend to describe the contemporary persecution of the church under the power of Rome and the local authorities. Um, even amillennialist G.K. Beale is forced to concede that the description of the two beasts in Revelation chapter 13 is based in part on Job chapters 40 to 41. Commentators cite the Job passages, continues Beale, but rarely discuss them or develop their relationship with Revelation. These two beasts, says Beale, are echoed throughout Revelation 13. And Beale rightly understands the two beasts in Job chapters 40 to 41 as, quote, two demonic beings. On the assumption that the beginning of history must be recapitulated at the end of history, says Beale, Judaism crystallized the implicit expectation of Job. These two beasts were symbolic of the powers of evil and were to be destroyed at the final judgment. Now, Beale's comments about the beginning of history being recapitulated at the end of history, they're quite instructive. As a preterist, I would simply qualify this by pointing out that we're not talking about the end of world history, but the end of Old Covenant history. No Jew living in the Second Temple period would have read about a seven-headed beast rising from the sea or the abyss and not have immediately thought of Leviathan. In fact, the same can be said of the Gentiles in that era. According to Freison, the Leviathan tradition is one of the great mythic patterns shared by Yahwism and the surrounding religious traditions and is a common theme in the late Hellenistic and early Roman period. This common theme of a seven-headed beast is clearly seen on what is known as the Tel, As the Tel Asmar cylinder seal, which dates to the end of the third millennium BC. According to scholar William D. Barker, this may be the oldest attested representation of the creature we now know as the biblical Leviathan. This here, um, this is just an artist reworking of the Tel Asmar cylinder seal. Um, again, you can see, you can clearly see the seven-headed beast. Um, it's being speared by two men, or more likely two deities. Four of the heads lay limp, um, as if they've been mortally wounded, while the remaining three heads continue to struggle with uh, one of the combatants. Um, Barker notes, Every culture in the ancient Near East used the Leviathan motif, but there were several differences in the application of it in both form and function. In some cultures, it was simply a seven-headed beast, while in others, it was a seven-headed dragon or serpent, most notably the Ugaritic and Hebrew literature. Uh, this, can be, this can be seen in a comparison of various biblical passages with different Ugaritic texts. These biblical passages would include Habakkuk 3, Isaiah 27, and Psalm 74. 
in Isaiah, Leviathan is called the fleeing serpent and the twisted serpent. And Psalm 74 mentions Yahweh crushing the multiple heads of Leviathan. Brian Gadawa notes that the Hebrew words in these texts are equivalent to the Ugaritic words describing the same creature to the uh, text in the left to the slide. Um, what Gadawa is saying here is, is no exaggeration. Scholar Richard Aberbach notes that the correspondence between the Hebrew texts and the Ugaritic texts are simply indisputable. And Averback says it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that Isaiah 27.1, for example, is a free quotation of Baal's battle with the sea monster. Now, don't, don't let a liberal put a slant on that. That doesn't mean the biblical writers plagiarize the Baal cycle. It means, very simply, no, it's not Baal who defeats the chaos monster, it's Yahweh. This is an example of a polemic, not a plagiarization. Now, until the discovery of the Ugaritic texts in 1928, it was literally impossible for Bible commentators to know this stuff. That's why it's so, so very important to keep up with modern scholarship. As Heiser says with, with regard to the Ugaritic texts, you might be thinking that you'll, all you really need to know about the religion of the Israelites is in the Bible. You'd only be partially correct in that thought. We are centuries removed from the world of the Bible. And a lot of the material in the Bible is pretty obtuse to those of us in the 21st century. Those who wrote the Bible were not writing for a technological society. And so words, phrases, descriptions, and concepts that were completely familiar to an Israelite are simply lost on us. Now, I love that quote from Heiser. And today, we think it's the opposite, you know. We think the Bible's describing things that are completely familiar to us, but not to its original readers. Um, you hear preachers talking about revelations describing uh, cobra helicopters with nuclear weapons, but those, those ignorant and ancient people just didn't know how to describe these things. I say what an arrogant, pretentious attitude we modern people, people have. It is us. We are the ones who are ignorant. Ignorant of the symbols, motifs, and concepts of the ancient world. It's our job to go back and rediscover these concepts that would have been completely familiar to ancient people, but have become lost to us. And one of those concepts that would have been completely familiar to the Israelites, or any person for that matter, is the concept of the chaos monster the seven-headed beast, the Hebrew Leviathan, and Ugaritic Lotan. Um, here's another one. This is, uh, well, let me start here. Revelation 13, 1 through 2, seems to, describe, seems to be a composite description of the seven-headed beast. Using the traditions of the various cultures of the ancient Near East, as Adela Collins says, in her dissertation, The Combat Myth in the Book of Revelation, John's description is a fusion of diverse traditions that do not seem possible to interpret strictly within an Israelite Jewish framework alone. She argues, rather, that the author was deliberately choosing to be international by composing his narrative with elements taken from a variety of cultural contexts. Um, in his book, Isaiah's Kingship Polemic, Daniel Barker states that the chaos motif in some ancient cultures was actually that of a seven-headed lion. And remember, in Revelation, John describes the beast in terms of a lion, a bear, a leopard, and the familiar Ugaritic and Hebrew dragon. Another ancient artifact depicting the seven-headed beast is known as the Sumerian shell plaque. Shows it with a spotted body, which I would suggest is reminiscent of a leopard. Notice as well the fatal wound to one of its heads. 
In my opinion, I think this, there's a distinct possibility that this is the imagery that may be undergirding Revelation 13.3. And I saw one of its heads as if it had been slain, and its fatal head wound was healed. Um, this is just an artist's rendition of the Sumerian shell plaque. You can get a better look at it here. Uh, again, you can see the seven heads, the spotted leopard-like body, and uh, the fatal wound to one of its heads. So what does this mean, and how does it help us in understanding the book of Revelation? For ancient peoples, Leviathan symbolized the chaotic forces of darkness that had to be subdued and conquered before order and purpose could be brought to the world. In the creation accounts of the ancient cultures, order was brought to the world through the slaying of a sea dragon who represented chaos by that culture's god or deity. In Babylonian literature, it's Marduk versus Tiamat. In the Ugaritic literature, it's Baal versus Lotan or Yom. In ancient Egypt, the battle was fought every night as Ra defeated Apophis every morning when the sun came up. Brian Gadawa notes that the, that the Sumerians had three stories where their gods dis, destroy beasts in pursuing and establishing order. And um, as I was working on this in a recent episode of the Naked Bible podcast, it's episode 225 if you want to check it out, Michael Heiser kind of talked about this international or you know, cross-cultural uh, thing going on with Leviathan. Um, Heiser talks about how Leviathan was a very well-known symbol for chaos in the ancient world. Everyone in the ancient world knows this stuff, says Heiser. He explains that if we were Canaanites, we'd talk about Lotan, and Baal is the one who defeats Lotan. If you were Babylonian, you would say the great chaos monster was Tiamat. That's who Marduk defeats. And it's Marduk who brings order to the world. Every culture wanted to claim that it was their god who defeated and or defeats the chaos monster. In Job 41.8, God addresses this. God asks Job to remember the battle. What battle? The battle at the beginning of crea creation that all ancient cultures were familiar with. Yahweh says that he and he alone is the one who defeats Leviathan, verse 9. Verse 25 states that when Leviathan raises himself up, the mighty fear. The word translated mighty is El, the ancient word for God or goddess. Yahweh is saying, contrary to the claims of other cultures, their gods not only didn't defeat Leviathan, their gods are actually afraid of him. just as Yahweh defeated Leviathan at the beginning of creation. So, too, he defeats Leviathan at the Exodus event, which, as Glenn said, is described as a new creation. This is brought out very clearly in Psalm 74 and Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51, 9 through 10, states, Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces? Rahab is another name for the Hebrew Leviathan. Was it not you who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, and made the depth of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? You see, this is the Exodus event, and it's tying it into a defeat of the chaos monster. Verses 15 to 16 go on to say, for I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea, and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth, and have covered you with the shadow of my hand, and Glenn read this verse, to establish the heavens, and lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, you are my people. The great Puritan theologian John Owen noted that the Exodus event is... And, and, and the, establish, the establishment of the covenant with Israel is in fact described in this passage in terms of a creation 
of the heavens and the earth. Mike talked about, you know, bringing people to some of the uh, older commentators just to show them that, hey, something has an ancient tradition of interpretation. You're speaking to a reform guy, John Owen's the place to go. And uh, trust me, if they're not a preterist, that quote from Owen will blow their mind. The bottom line here is, if the establishment of the Old Covenant is described in these terms, it's no surprise then that the calling out of God's New Covenant people would be accompanied by the defeat of the chaos beast, Revelation 19, and followed by the creation of a new heaven and new earth, Revelation 21 to 22. The Old Testament, in fact, looked forward to this third and final defeat of chaos in what is known as Isaiah's little apocalypse, Isaiah 27.1. In that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. So, if Isaiah's little apocalypse previewed Leviathan being vanquished once and for all, where do we find this final victory over chaos being referred to in John's big apocalypse, so to speak. I would suggest Revelation 19.20, where the seven-headed beast is thrown alive into the lake of fire. And again, Revelation 13.10, speaking of the sea beast, says, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword, he must be killed. Leviathan, in Isaiah 27.1, is pierced with Yahweh's fierce, great, and mighty sword. And Revelation 19.15 speaks of the sharp sword that comes from Yeshua's mouth. And with regard to this, interestingly, I would note that the only other place in the New Testament where this exact word for captivity is used is Ephesians 4.8, where Jesus conquers the demonic, the demonic spirits associated with the land of Bashan and takes them captive. Thus, the word is previously associated with the captivity of divine beings. I would suggest that it is being used here the same way. Yahweh is once again taking Leviathan into captivity, this time permanently in the lake of fire. In The Backgrounds and Meaning of the Image of the Beast by Rebecca Yi Lu, she makes the following just great observation. The Bible starts and ends with the making of an image. The first mention of the making of an image is found in Genesis chapter 1, the making of human beings in God's image. The language of Revelation 13 alludes to the Genesis story of the creation of human beings. Verbally, the language of Revelation 13 parallels the language of creation in Genesis chapters 1 through 2. The same nouns occur in both passages, sea, land, beasts, image. Stephen Fryson notes that sacrificial activity for the emperors took place in a myriad of contexts. Emperors were worshipped in their own temples, at the temples of other gods, in theaters, in gymnasiums, in stoas, in judicial settings, in private homes and elsewhere. Imperial cults, says Freisen, were everywhere. Just as man was made to be God's image bearer by subduing the earth and bringing order to God's creation, Nero became the image bearer of Leviathan, God's age-old enemy, and attempted to bring chaos to God's newly created order, the New Covenant Church. The role of Nero Caesar in the book of Revelation is blatantly obvious. As Adela Collins notes, Revelation chapters 13 and 17 express, quote, a clear and intense interest in the figure of Nero. Another thing that is blatantly obvious is 
the Leviathan imagery that undergirds Revelation's portrayal of the beast. When these two factors are taken together, Nero's death prior to A.D. 70 is irrelevant to the overall picture John is painting. Nero Caesar was merely the temporal manifestation of something that pre- and post-dates his time on the throne. Nero died in A.D. 68, but the chaotic forces of darkness continued to wage their war for two more years. They failed. While the city lay in ruins, while the temple lay in ruins, and the city of Jerusalem in rubble, the heavenly temple and city that we are all a part of today rose from the ashes. And the chaotic forces of darkness that attempted to halt Yahweh's plans to bring all peoples into the new city and new temple are forever consigned to the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Thank you, everybody.